Good evening. Welcome to Write America. I'm Alice Hutchinson, owner of Birds Books, an independent bookstore in Bethel, Connecticut, and I'm honored to be the host of Write America. The aim of this series is to help set the country back on a correct, productive course of freedom, justice, equality, and plain human kindness. Write America is a literary series spearheaded by author Roger Rosenblatt, featuring award-winning, nationally renowned authors and a new and emerging writers and in readings and conversations each week about how books and art might bridge the deep divisions in our na nation. Roger Rosenblatt, the esteemed writer and creator of Write America, puts it this way. Writing makes justice desirable, evil intelligible, grief endurable, and love possible. So welcome. And please join us every Monday evening at this time as many of the most beloved and distinguished writers in the country read from their works and talk to each other and with you, all in an effort to bring us together. Tonight, Birds Books hosts oh, Write America with a reading by and a conversation with Emma Walton Hamilton and Hilma Wolitzer. I will return afterwards to bring your questions and comments to the authors. For those of you who might be unfamiliar with Crowdcast, many of you have already discovered the chat to the right of your screen. Feel free to converse and comment at will. Secondly, if you would like to ask a question, don't ask it in the chat. There's a button below that says ask a question and that's where I will go to look at the questions to ask at the very end and I'll get to as many as I possibly can. Third, there is right below the screen a buy books buy the books from birds books birds books is the is the host of right america and we carry the books in our store and to support this program and the bookstore we ask that you please consider it now more about our speakers emma walton hamilton is an award-winning writer producer and arts director together with her mother julie andrews she has written over 30 books for children and young adults Emma is on the faculty of Stony Brook University's MFA in Creative Writing, where she serves as director of the Children's Lit Fellows and the Young Artists and Writers Project. One of the books that we have carried is this one, which you may be familiar with. Please welcome to the screen, as soon as I bring her up, sorry about that, Hilma. I picked up the wrong person. It says, there you go. Sorry about that. No worries. Hello, everybody. I'm hearing a tremendous echo, Alice. Is that is that expected? Uh, I am not sure, but I will toggle off in case it's coming from me. All right, thank you. So, uh, hello, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. I think I'm going to take my headphones out because I'm concerned that that may be where this echo is coming. Um, I'm also being told that people can't see me. Are you not being seen? I don't hear you. Nope. Very little. So maybe if you turn up your volume. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. All righty. Uh, apologies for the tech everybody, but um, I am still hearing an echo. So if I seem a little uh, disjointed, that's why. Most of you know me as a children's author and a collaborator with my mother, Julie Andrews, on her memoirs and other projects. But tonight, I'll be reading from my new poetry collection entitled Door to Door, which will be published by Andrews McMeal in the fall of 2022. Uh, the collection is structured as a book-length sonnet, 
and, and can best be described as a plea for accident and grace in a world where wonder is too often supplanted by obligation. The poems themselves are mostly autobiographical. Parts one, two, and four encompass a range of poems and a range of forms and subjects, and they include home, creativity, marriage, parenting, aging, grief and loss, politics, the making of art, and the mysteries of the natural world. Part three represents the sonnet's turn and features poems inspired by the life and writings of the 19th century writer, philosopher, and sometime hermit, Prentice Mulford, who was born and raised in my hometown of Sag Harbor, New York, and who traveled the world and ultimately spent a decade living off the grid in a cabin he built uh, in the swamps of Passaic, New Jersey, while commuting to New York City to work as a journalist. The poetry collection concludes with a poetic couplet that punctuates the recurring themes of nature, work, and art. Um, let's see, I'll start tonight with one of the poems that speaks to both home and art. And I would just love to know, could you let me know in the chat if you can hear and see me because I'm still hearing a terrible echo, which is confusing. So if you could just let me know whether you can see and hear me in the chat, I will begin. Excellent, thank you. All right, uh, this first poem is called The Tuning Fork in the Bathroom. Head erect and tines astride, the armless conductor invites the chamber to resonate with acoustic assonance. But there are no strings in this ensemble, no ebony or brass, only porcelain and tile, glass and chrome. Where has it come from? Who stationed it here? And what is the value of sine waves at the fundamental frequency in this miniature suite? I relocate this pitch fork, but it invariably returns to its post between the his and hers sinks harmonizing with each brush and flush and humming while I fiddle with my hair, pick or pluck at minor divertissements and compose myself in prelude to the day. Now in keeping with the themes of the Write America project, I'll share a couple of poems with political roots. This one was written during the 2008 election cycle. I'll let you infer what you will. It's entitled Job Listing. Ringmaster wanted for quadrennial American extravaganza temporarily down at heel. Duties include crowd control, clown combat, and vamping for time. Must have experience with fiery hoops, high wires, and elephants. Own shovel a plus. All right, I'm gonna move on to a more recent poem entitled New Year's Eve. I'll let you guess which year. No, my friend, you were not just a thief, slaughterer or scaremonger. You may not have that satisfaction. You took more than you gave, but the sample you allowed eclipsed the rest. Despite the shockwaves threatening past and future, and sucking the marrow from our joy, your tangerine dreams, your upside down world and terrorist tactics served only to widen our eyes and expand our hearts. We have awoken from our sleep and you have simply strengthened our purpose and resolve. Tomorrow, you will be a number on a pair of plastic glasses while we take your measure and rise above to love each other once again. And now a poem called Global Warming. The burst spigot sprays the river birch with upside down rain, sheathing every branch in frozen glass. A hundred slender jewel cases refracting winter light 
and magnifying the showpiece within. One by one, the casings drop to the pockmarked snow beneath, fractured vials littering the walkway, leaving hungover branches to droop and drip in memory of crystal-induced radiance. I'm gonna segue now to share three of the poems from the uh, third section of the collection, uh, which are written in the voice of the 19th century author and philosopher, Prentice Mulford. The first is called Swamp Angel. Two years of my 49 spent as an indifferent sailor, 12 in California, digging a little gold and a good deal of dirt. I have taught school, tended bar, kept a grocery, sorted mail, collected tax, policed men, sorted seagull eggs, started a hog ranch, and prospected for silver. I ran a hotel into the ground and a farm to weeds. I killed a coyote. I have seen Cape Horn, London, Paris, Vienna, a whale in a flurry, and a ship's crew in mutiny. I have lectured and written for the papers. I have an ex-mother-in-law. And the world has returned kick for kick, frown for frown, smile for smile. But I have had no adventure, no success, no failure as great as in this house I built in the woods in a swamp with a spring nearby beside a noble wide branching oak. My faults, whatever they are within these four walls, trouble no one but myself. I can leave my slippers as I took them off, one toe pointing north, the other south, and find them a week afterward in the same position. I fear not to leave mud on my own carpet. I am tormented by no neighbor's culinary smells. I keep hens. Yet I have hardly touched the edge of life and know little what it means to live, save thoughts are things. The second poem addresses Prentice Mulford's commute from his shack in the woods uh, in the swamp of Passaic, New Jersey to New York daily. Each morning, I foot the mile to the railway station and reach the city by half past seven. At the newspaper office, I make a summary of the same eternal round of events. Murders, burglaries, suicides, by pistol, razor, rape, or poison. Embezzlements, high-toned, thefts, low-toned, smash-ups, fires, burst boilers, falling elevators, glass explosions, kerosene burnings, failures, and everything else, which happens in all civilized communities just the same one year after another. The only difference being that the victim or the villain has a different name this year from the same date last. I wonder why people are interested in reading such a monotonous and ghastly catalog of horrors as I dish up for them daily. I wonder if they will so continue to read through all eternity in case their lives are spared that somewhat incomputable period. I wonder what the profit is of knowing after you have eaten your breakfast cakes and sausage that a tramp was found last night hanging from a tree in Central Park, or that an idiot killed himself with prussic acid and died on a park bench, where possibly you may sit tomorrow because the girl he wanted to marry and make miserable preferred to be married and made miserable by some other idiot. Yet I serve up this intellectual stew made from the ingredients of our barbaric civilization with a tolerably clear conscience. First, because I am well paid for it. Second, because I like the work. And third, because the public wants their daily horrors spiced as I spice them. And then I fly back by rail to my beloved swamp, where I labor until dusk, overlooked only by an occasional crow perched 
on a neighboring sycamore, cross, tired, and hungry, because there is no young corn yet to pull up. My final poem in this section is titled, Brooding in the Gloom. Despite all I have done to gain seclusion, the cares of the outside world invade. I parry against every small intrusion, outwitted by decisions to be made. Whether to have toast or eggs for breakfast, buy a hoe or borrow from my neighbor, whether to pelt to plant cabbages or lettuce, repair my roof with tin or tar and paper, whether to buy a $10 knapsack or make a 65 cent one suffice, whether to scold the absent-minded boot black for shoddiness of shine or tip him twice. Yet in these thousand thoughts of every day, which I am well ashamed to hear confess. I shall or shall not, should or shouldn't, may. I am creator of my own distress. And while I trudge from swampland home to train, my thoughts a muddle and my will opaque, nature does her best to entertain with the splendors of a sunrise on the lake. And now I'll conclude with a poem from the book's final couplet about the color blue in nature, which is apparently not a pigment at all, but a perception informed by the spectrum of light. It's called prism. No blue birds, only blue wavelengths bouncing on particles, glistening blue. No blue eyes, only blue sky, dancing in fragments, sparkling blue. No blue sky, only blue light, surfing on currents, shimmering blue. No blue water, only blue echoes rippling the firmament, burnishing birds. Thank you. Emma, thank you so much. That was just wonderful. Um, our next presenter is Hilma Wolitzer, who is a recipient of the Guggenheim and National Endowment for the Arts Fellowships, an American Academy of Arts and Letters Award in Literature, and a Barnes and Noble Writers for Writers Award. She has taught at Iowa Writers Workshop, New York University, Columbia University, and the Breadloaf Writers Conference. Her first published story appeared when she was 36 and her first novel eight years later. Her many stories and novels have drawn critical praise for illuminating the dark interiors of the American home. She lives in New York City. And this book very recently has just come out. It is her new book of stories. I'd like to welcome to the screen. Hilma, let me unmic you and you're good to go. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alice. Thank you very much for hosting this, Alice, and for Bird's Books. And thank you to Roger for making this all happen. He's a great, great supporter of everyone here. And thank you, Emma. I really enjoyed your work. Uh, I found it inspired and inspiring. I love the wit. I love the inner rhyme. I love the alliteration. I love the whole thing. I'm going to read from this book that Alice held up. Mine has post-its in it. I'm going to read the final story, the only new story in the collection. It's called The Great Escape. I wrote it last year in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, the oldest story in the book is 56 years old. This story takes place at the very beginning of the pandemic, right before it and then during it. And I'm going to read two passages. This is the beginning of the story, The Great Escape. I used to look at Howard 
first thing in the morning to see if he was awake too. And if he wanted to get something going before one of the kids crashed into the room and plopped down between us like an Amish bundling board. Lately though, with the children long grown and gone to their own marriage beds, I found myself glancing over to see if Howard was still alive, holding my breath while I watched for the shallow rise and fall of his, the way I had once watched for a promising rise in the bedclothes. Whenever I saw that he was breathing and that the weather waited just behind the blinds to be let in, I felt an irrational surge of happiness. Another day, and then another, and another, and another. Breakfast, vitamins, bills, argument, blood pressure pills, lunch, doctor, cholesterol medicine, the telephone, supper, TV, sleeping pills, sleep, waking. It seemed as if it would all go on forever in that exquisitely boring and beautiful way, but of course it wouldn't. Everyone knows that. There were running death jokes in our family. My father driving past the cemetery. Everybody's dying to get in. My mother, death must be great. Nobody ever comes back. Howard's mother, when one of us dies, I'm going to Florida. That would have been funny, except that she actually meant it. Now, none of them was laughing or ever coming back. Howard's father, who had no apparent sense of humor, was the first to go, quickly, of a blood clot that stopped his heart like a bullet. This sent Howard right to the precipice without fair warning. Next, he seemed to be summoned as if he'd been waiting his turn at the deli counter. He even told me that his number was up, extending the metaphor. He wasn't next, though. His pushy mother cut the line and went second succumbing to kidney failure after a short, spirited stint as the merry widow of Boca Raton. Then my parents sailed off into the abyss, felled in tandem by dementia and a series of strokes. We'd had our own health scares, Howard's enlarged prostate, a lump in my breast. Several of our friends beat us to it anyway in a kind of social massacre while in what seemed like only a few long afternoons, he and I turned 70 and then 80 and then nearly 90. Now, this is a passage later in the story, right after the beginning of the pandemic. And because this is a Zoom event and I had so much trouble mastering Zoom, I felt it was appropriate to read this section. It was my friend Ruth's turn to host our book group, but on the advice of her son, Jeffrey, a radiologist, she called everyone to change the venue. We were going to have a Zoom meeting, whatever that was, instead of convening at her place. There was much nervous back and forth among the members of the group about this latest development. It sounded easy enough though, We'd all receive a link, and at the specified time, we would simply open it and go from there. Ours was strictly a women's group, and the few husbands still around were usually banned from our meetings. Whenever it was my turn, I took my laptop into the living room, where the refreshments were laid out, and Howard skulked off to the bedroom like a grounded teenager, closing the door behind him. But the Zoom meeting changed all of that. Enough aloneness. We had to stick together. Ruth, long a widow, would have Jeffrey right beside her to help facilitate things. And I invited Howard to sit next to me on the bed with the laptop between us. I hit the link and we waited. The way our ancestors must have waited for the flickering magic lantern to do its thing. After what seemed like a long time, the screen filled with a notice that our meeting would begin soon. Well, this is exciting, I said. Mrs. Bridge was my favorite novel with its brief, brilliant paragraphs like vaudeville blackouts and characters I would think about wistfully as if they were old friends with whom I'd lost touch. I loved Mrs. Bridge, 
even when she exasperated me. She was a product of her circumstances, of her time and place, but I still wanted her to have more insight and more courage and to make better choices. The way I had once wished for a happier, out, happier outcome for Emma Bovary and Anna Karenina. I was gripping my dog-eared underlined book and looking forward to saying some of all that when, one of, when our meeting began, if it ever did. Suddenly, Ruth's and Jeffrey's faces loomed before us, almost as big as life. They were both wearing the kind of masks my daughter Anne said you couldn't buy anymore for love or money. Then one of them seemed to bark piercingly, and Jeffrey shouted, mute, Evelyn, mute. Evelyn Lasky and Mildred, her ancient, incontinent, and yappy Maltese. How, Evelyn cried, oh, oh, what do I do? While Mildred barked in frantic unison. Just hit your damn mute button, Jeffrey commanded through his mask, as muffled and menacing as Darth Vader, and shut that dog up. So much for his bedside manner, I thought, but didn't say. What if I wasn't muted either? Then the faces of all the other women in our book group popped up, each in a separate little frame, like the celebrities on Hollywood squares. Some of the women's mouths were moving soundlessly. Only Evelyn's frame was empty until she whizzed by calling, Mildred, stay, come. Everyone else unmute, Jeffrey ordered. And soon there was a cacophony of voices, a chorus of confusion and dismay. And someone's cell phone chirped and chirped. So this is what I've been missing all these years, Howard said. Then Ruth was in the center of the screen again, sans Jeffrey, holding up her copy of, Mr. of Mrs. Bridge and wiggling it. Settle down, people, she said, like the middle school teacher she had once been. Now, who would like to begin? I raised my hand and leaned eagerly forward the way I had in AP English, just that the connection was broken and everyone grew silent and disappeared. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. That was wonderful, Hilma. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I identify with the uh, with the Zoom, the technical challenges which seem to be happening here as well this evening. Yes. I mean, okay. not in, not okay. more, just the technical challenges in your in your story. Yeah, I had a lot of trouble with Zoom. I seem to have forgotten I did not have a touch screen and I began poking it frantically when I couldn't hear the people <laughs> speaking and it didn't do anything. Well, I think it's kind of wonderful that we're here, both of us here tonight um, with mother-daughter writing relationships. Oh, we have so many mother-daughter connections. I just can't believe it. I know you know my daughter, Meg. I do. I know her very well. I work with her at Stony Brook, Southampton. We work together. And though I never met your mother, I have admired her from afar for a very long time. And in fact, I took my own mother when your mother was about 19 to a matinee of the boyfriend. So really? There's another mother-daughter connection. Indeed. And and though Meg and I, you and your mother collaborate. We on, do. On yes, books. we do. We've we've books. written a number of books together. Yeah. How does that work? I'm thinking of a musical comedy, perhaps, where somebody writes the music and somebody writes the lyrics. Yes, it's it's actually not like that. It's it's um, we both tend to do a little bit of everything. Um, we we finish each other's sentences. We we brain typically we brainstorm uh, ideas and outlines together, and then when we start writing, it's really a very organic process of just um, thinking out loud. And I'm the scribe, and I take notes, and uh, and we literally sort of write it orally together as I'm taking notes, and then. Uh, and then work together on the revision process. Do either of it's, you have the final word? Uh, the best idea wins. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> so you agree and on somehow it. we, yeah, we somehow we always seem to agree on what the best idea is. We always seem to know it when we land on it. You would imagine that, I mean, we didn't know when we first started writing together what the result would be because it could have been very explosive. We're both fairly strong-minded, opinionated women. Um, but happily, I think what what helps is that we have different strengths. So uh, my mom tends to be more of the visionary, more of the the big ideas and the the uh, the openings and the closings and the uh, fun asides and the unusual characters. And I'm more of the nuts and bolts and the sort of first act, second act, third act. And you know, we need a transition here. Or we we have to you know not write what the art will show or whatever the the more concrete details are. It sounds like a perfect collaboration. Meg and it, I it works not, very well. Yeah, Meg and I do not collaborate on work. We do share work with one another. Uh, I assume that you also share work that you separate from your mother with your mother. We, I do absolutely. Yeah, and how does that work, Hilma? Does we, that do? You, are you are you very candid with each other, or are you careful in your feedback? Well, I have to say that Meg. Unlike me, I was a very late bloomer. Meg began writing when she was a child and she was talented and she was my child. So when she asked me to read something, I was full of praise and full of pride and I was so happy about it. And she got very angry one day and she said, you just like everything I do. And I realized that she really wanted to be respected as a writer. She wanted me to treat her work with more seriousness. And so the next time I was more critical, of course, she burst into tears. So I had to find the happy medium that way. Now, of course, she's an adult and um, we're careful with one another's feelings, but we're also totally honest. And, and I, I think that's very helpful. And I think it's what I learned as a teacher that that balance of honesty and charity in a workshop works in a personal uh, relationship with another writer. That's the perfect way to describe it, a balance of honesty and charity. I think that's, I think that's exactly how I would describe my relationship with my mother. And, you know, Did you start writing as a child? I did. I was, a, I was an avid reader and writer um, I wrote stories, I wrote poetry, I wrote all kinds of things, um, and I read a great deal as a child, and uh, and as did my mother, actually. She she wrote stories to entertain herself when she was a child. She was a child performer, a professional child performer, and she was on tour a great deal, so her writing and her reading were her companions, essentially, um, while she was at work. And she encouraged you. And she very much encouraged me. As a matter of fact, I had a sort of detour. Um, when I was a child, people used to say to me, what are you going to be when you grow up? And I would quite often say, well, I'm going to be, uh, well, for a period of time, I was going to be a veterinarian or I was going to be you know, a, a, a fireman. And then it was, I'm going to be an actress. And she always said, she says that now, but you'll see she's really going to be a writer. And for a while, I was an actress, and I, I was never a veterinarian or a fireman, but I did segue and have a, a life in the theater for quite some time. And um, it's it's interesting that I've come back full circle to fulfill her prophecy. And that, <laughs> that you uh, recognize your talent, which yeah. is Yeah. When I was a child and I wrote really bad poetry, and I did not grow up in a literary household, um, nobody interfered with my doing it but nobody seemed to pay too much attention to it until my mother went to a parent teacher conference at school and came back glowing and told my father very proudly that miss fredericks my fourth grade teacher had said that hilma shows great promise and after that when i wrote my little terrible poems uh, my parents played cards a few nights a week they would invite me to recite my poems to these card players who really just wanted to get back to the next, get to the next hand. They weren't interested, but they were polite and they applauded. And I felt gratified by this. And then I really felt that that sort of 
encouraged me and started me on my career. But then 50 years, about 50 years later, when I was a published writer, I was giving a reading in New Jersey in a library and a tiny little old woman came up to me and said, you don't recognize me. I'm Miss Fredericks, your fourth grade teacher. Oh my goodness. I mean, I, I couldn't have made something like this up. Uh, and I began gushing and I just said, oh, Miss Fredericks, thank you so much. You made such a difference in my life uh, because you told my mother that I showed great promise. And she just said, oh, honey, I told that to all the mothers. Oh. It's really put me in my place. Yeah. Well, let's hope she empowered another a number of other young people as well. Yeah. But uh, uh, at your job, you're teaching, aren't you? Yes, I do teach. I teach um, both uh, undergraduate. Well, I, I actually teach a, a range of um, ages. I, I uh, also run a program that is in middle schools and high schools, a writing program. But my primary focus these days is um, undergraduate and graduate writing programs, and I teach children's literature and playwriting and um, uh, business of being a writer. And I love every minute of it. And soon poetry as well. Yeah. I don't know yeah. about that. I don't know about that. Poetry is, um, it's new for me. I mean, it, this was a big thing for me to share tonight. I, uh, I, I recently um, crazily completed my own master's degree in the same program in which I teach. Wow. And uh, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was very was schizophrenic. Was it was poetry. Thesis? This book? Yeah, this book was my, my piece. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. And, uh, and I did it really strictly for myself because I've always written poetry, even when I was a child and poetry is what I, I love and makes my heart sing. Um, but I never had any real ambition, even, you know, primarily my professional life as a writer is in children's literature and memoir and um, nonfiction. And so it, I didn't really have an ambition to be a published poet. But um, but when I decided to make it my thesis, my my wonderful thesis advisor, Julie, Julie Sheehan, who is a, a Whiting Award winning poet. I know her. You, I'm sure you do. Yeah. She nudged me and she said, uh, you know, you really should submit. And um, lo and behold. That's a wonderful story. Yeah, it's and it's so I mean, I have to say it's never too late for, for anybody listening who is uh, starting out late in life. I'm uh, turning 59 this year and will be a published poet for the first time in my life. I am so 91 and I am now it. having another book published. I'll be 92. I know. Before. I'm so amazed by that. And, Hilma, and honestly, I, you, I started, you know, I was called the great middle age hope at one point. I was billed as that because my first novel came out when I was 44. So talking about it's never too late. It really is. There it the is. great thing about writing is nobody sees you in your pajamas. You don't have to have great right. legs. Um, you just have to be. Until you end up on a screen like this, right? Right, exactly. That's unfortunate. But the yeah. screen, you don't have to have anything. You don't have to be wearing anything from the waist down, which is also No, you great. don't. Nobody right. knows. I may have my pajama bottoms on and you don't know. Y exactly right. I may as well. That's that's part of the the great mystery of being a writer is you get to uh, have a have a private life. I'm trying. I'm thinking a little bit about women as writers, and I remember when I started writing. Of course, was when I began publishing short stories. It was in the '60s. Um, the first one came out in '66, and. I think it was a little harder for women then, and I, I was it was I was on the cusp of the second wave of feminism, which really gave me encouragement. And you know, I was raised by a housewife to be a housewife, and I was fine with that. But uh, I also remember that my very first newspaper interview, the headline said, "Housewife turns into writer," and I really don't think that. Had I been a male working in a uh, butcher shop or an insurance office, that anyone would have said butcher turns into writer. That's exactly right. And and I wondered if your experience so much later, and you're being so much younger, you're younger than my both of my children. Um, if if you found there was it was an easier 
reception for for a woman to publish at that point? Uh, well, I, I without question, I did, but I I wonder too how much of that had to do with the fact that I was raised in a very arts centric family, um, you know, in a, in a sort of a rarefied environment that uh, both both well. All four of my parents, I should say, because my my mother and father were divorced when I was very young and both remarried. And all four of my parents and both my families um, worked professionally in the arts. And there was never a question as to, you know, whether or not I could pursue a professional life or a creative life. It, it was just a given. And um, yeah, I, I, I feel very fortunate in that regard. Um, I will say that doesn't mean that I don't struggle with all the challenges of being a, a, a wife and a parent and, um, you know, a professional person and a homeowner and, you know, everything that I think all women, all, all people these days struggle with. Yeah, um, it is hard to balance it all. Yeah, I, I wish I had a wife. <laughs> I wish all, I had an assistant or a wife. Yeah, yeah no exactly. About it. Uh, I think that my daughter had an easier time of it in two ways. One, I got married first, had children, and then became a writer. Right. Uh, she became a writer first, and I published my first novel at 44. She was 22, exactly half that age, when she published her first novel. And then after that success and, and a few other books, she married and had children and continued her career. And I think that my husband and I were always very accepting of her as a writer. First of all, I, I don't think I was exactly a role model for her because I was also very, very busily ensconced in um, domestic chores at the same time same time I was writing, I was still making fancy jello molds. I mean, I was using that creative energy in so many different ways. And finally, mm -hmm. I freed myself. And I think that those, those feminists uh, who first wrote about women's right to have complicated lives to, to, and to have creative lives really made a difference for me. And I think that she was already uh, encouraged and, and, um, I didn't have an education by the way either. So that made a very big difference. I got married very young and then immediately, you know, just began making jello molds and having children. And right. it was fine because, uh, it gave me literary fodder that domestic life gave me a lot of material that I later used. But it gave was your me, family uh, was your family supportive when you started writing in your forties? I had to. Well, it was in my thirties actually when I started writing. Oh. In my forties, when the novels began coming, but the sh I wrote short stories for a long time. And at first, I think my husband did not really like it because I had not contracted to be a writer. I had contracted right. to be a wife and a mother. And then, of course, he became more and more enthusiastic about it as it went along. And my parents too who were very loving and supportive in every other way. Um, if I, before I published, when I was writing short stories at the kitchen table on a standard typewriter with the kids running around and the dog barking and so forth. And my mother would call me and say, what are you doing today? And I would say, I'm writing a short story. And she would just say, well, did the sheets get there from Macy's yet? I mean, it, it was as if I hadn't even said anything. But then when the story, the first story was sold, it's the title story of the book, uh, Today a Woman Went Mad in the Supermarket. It's, a, it's an apt title for what I was going through. Um, and I told my parents about it. My father was so impressed. And he said, the Saturday Evening Post, why I read that at the dentist. And it gave it such authority to oh, him. Oh, yeah. And at that point, and I also got some money for my writing for the first time. And I went right across the street and bought my first car, a Rambler station wagon. I mean, I put a deposit down on it. I didn't right. get that much for the story. Um, and then I didn't publish another story for three years. 
and then it was to a small, very prestigious, but small literary magazine, which I got a tenth of what I've gotten from the Saturday Evening Post. So then I realized I wasn't in it for the money, which was just as well. Yes. Exactly. I'm sure you know that. I know that very well. Yeah. It's, I mean, that's one of the reasons why most of us teach, uh, do you, you know. Do you think people, you can teach writing? It's a question that comes up all the time. Do I think you can teach writing? Uh, I do. I do. I think that um, you can teach craft. Um, voice uh, is harder. Yeah, that's so innate. Yeah, voice is harder, but uh, but I you know I definitely think you can teach craft, um, and I think anybody has a talent or an innate gift. Maybe not necessarily for writing, but for uh, for for something. Everybody's good at something. It's a question of making yourself available to discover what that is. And um, I you know I the thing is that because I write with my mother and because I am her daughter and am very aware that I can be perceived as being privileged and having opportunities come my way that perhaps might not readily come to others as easily. Um, I've found that I've had to work harder to, mm -hmm. to earn uh, and, and to feel um, like I really am worthy of, of the title writer. In a sense, you know, I have I wrestle with imposter sy syndrome just as every writer does, um, and that has made me really double down and focus on craft and focus on developing my skills as a writer and and try to figure out how to convey that to others. And I'm sure you you have the same struggle. You're sitting there and facing the blank screen or the blank exactly. And and I'm sure you and and as far as the imposter syndrome goes, I mean. I'm still suffering from that. At yeah, I don't. I wonder if there's a writer who doesn't at some point suffer from that. I'm sure, you know, many writers, you know, I, I can't imagine that Philip Pullman suffers from imposter syndrome anymore, for instance. But um, well, I found a quote from Virginia Woolf where I can't remember which book she was writing, but she said, is it nonsense? Is it brilliance? And sometimes you really don't know what's the difference to you know and that's why i'm so grateful for having a, as a student reader as my daughter yeah yeah that's really helpful and does your mother feel flattered i mean she's of course so well known for her her musical career her acting career but also she is a writer and um is she pleased with you going into a field that she's in as well. Oh, enormously. Um, and, you know, we've overlapped several times in other fields. We've, um, when I was working in the theater um, and when I was working as an actor, we, we performed together um, in film. And um, then when I became a producer, uh, my husband and I uh, ran a professional regional theater here in Sag Harbor and we uh, gave her her directorial debut there. And so we've, we've, wow. You know, we've we've creatively collaborated in a number of ways, and I and actually an interesting story is that the very first, you know, we've now written over thirty books together, and the very first story that we wrote together, we wrote when I was actually five years old, and um, my parents were divorced and living on separate coasts, but still very friendly, and my mother had the idea that um, if she and I wrote a story together, and I brought it to my father when I went to visit him in the summer vacation, he, because he was an artist, is an artist and a, and a uh, illustrator and a production designer, um, he could then illustrate the story and then she would have it bound for me to keep as a sort of a, a, a memento or a totem of our um, continued familial connection to one another despite the divorce and despite the distance between us. And that little story, which I still have to this day, uh, later became one of our early published children's yeah. books. That's um, yeah. So so it's you know it's been very much a part of our collaboration from day one. And uh, and I you know she is she's enormously proud. I'm enormously proud of her. I mean she started writing 
um, her first books when I was a child. She wrote two uh, middle grade novels in the 70s, which are still in print today, and um, which she read to us, to, to me and to my stepbrother and stepsister as she was writing them. And so we would get, you know, a new chapter each each evening or each week or however time, however much time it took for her to write it. Um, and I just, I remember being so in awe of her, you know, making this transition to writing and how, how it, how captivating it was and how readily it seemed to come to her. And I guess I, in hindsight, I think that, um, you know, being cre a creative person, being in the theater, being in film, uh, being a musician or a singer, um, it's all forms of storytelling. Yeah. And, you know, so if you understand storytelling, if you understand, you know, dramatic structure, narrative arc, emotional arc, whatever you want to call it, it, it's the same thing. It just comes out in different ways, whether it's right. a play or a, or a role or a, a short story or a novel or a poem. Uh, my older daughter is a wonderfully inventive visual artist, and I started out as a visual artist, but I never really developed very well, and she's done a lot better than I ever did with it. So that's another part of it, too. It is, exactly. I think, I think your story of that little book when you were five shows your mother's brilliant maternal intuition. That was a very generous and brilliant thing to do. It um, was. I'm very, I'm quite impressed with that. Yeah, it absolutely was. And it, and it achieved its purpose on multiple levels. I mean, it really did, you know, cement the bond that we felt as a family, even though we were, you know, even though they were separated. Um, but it was also quite wonderful when later we were able to reimagine it as a, as a children's book. And it later we developed it as a musical for the stage as well. So oh, it, it wow. went on to have, yeah. And for the symphony yeah exactly um yeah we, we went on concert tour with it and the symphony and it you know it had all kinds of different lives so so the the moral of the story is don't throw anything away don't throw anything of your children's away because you never know hello ladies hello um, uh, we do have a couple of questions that i'd love to pose to you uh if you don't mind um this one's to emma Totally unfamiliar with your 19th century Sag Harbor personality with my British European background, but your verses brought a, a, a being vividly to life with a succinct sense of complexity and reflection. What attracted you to this subject and how did you find this distinctive voice and meter? What a wonderful question. Thank you so much for asking. Um, I discovered Prentice Mulford um, on a stroll through our local cemetery. Um, he's buried here in Sag Harbor, and his um, his gravestone says Prentice Mulford and his dates, and then it says philosopher, and then quotes thoughts are things, Mulford, and I I became very uh, intrigued by that concept of of thoughts are things, and uh, several years later, um, I discovered a book of his, believe it or not, on my mother's bookshelf a oh, gift wow. that had been given to her by my great aunt um, who apparently knew his writings and was charmed by them and gave my mother this copy of one of his books. And I, I made the connection and said, my goodness, this is the man who's buried in Sag Harbor in Oakland Cemetery. And I began to research him. And the more I researched, um, the more intrigued I became, not only by his life as a hermit living this sort of uh, thorough like existence in the in the shack in the woods but also you know other periods of his life when he was um you know in the gold rush and, and being a whaler and living on a on a boat in a union suit that he apparently never changed out of in san francisco harbor for some time i mean he has quite the story and um, the more i studied him the more charmed i became and uh, when i was pursuing my thesis um, one of the assignments was to write in the voice of a historic character. I just knew he was the one I wanted to aim for. I had so many of his writings that I'd collected over the years. And so I jumped in. This is for both of you. What book have you read that you wish you had written? Oh, so many. How about you, Hilma? Oh, there are a few. Uh, Mrs. Bridge, which I 
uh, spoke about in my story is a wonderful collection about, about another housewife actually living in the Midwest, uh, an upper middle class housewife in, in the 30s. What's wonderful about that book is that it's done in very short passages, which are like vaudeville blackouts. They're, they just hit you. They're funny and they're sad and they're dramatic and they're just, they're just wonderful. And the character, I think all artists predicated on desire and that the reader, the reader has to desire something. You don't have to provide what the reader desires, but you have to uh, incite that desire in the reader. And what I wanted was for Mrs. Bridge to figure out what she was doing wrong and to fix it. And it was frustrating, but it was also thrilling to read toward this. And I kept hoping that she'd suddenly have a revelation, that she'd have an epiphany. And I won't tell you uh, whether she does or doesn't. I'm not going to spoil it. And the other book, there are two other books I love. One is by the British writer Henry Green, and it's called Loving. And it's about uh, an Irish butler. And uh, the other one is um, Nathaniel West's Miss Lonely Hearts, mm. which is uh, an absolutely marvelous book. Um, it's, it's, it's fun. I love books that are both funny and tragic at the same time. And that one manages to be. Because I think life is like that. It's tragic and it's also hilarious. Absolutely true. I think for me, I'm a, I, as you probably guessed from my uh, previous reference, I'm a huge Philip Pullman fan. And um, when I first read The Golden Compass, you too. Yeah, I, I just thought, oh, that is the, that is how I would love to be able to write, just to be able to write with such um, insight and originality. And I mean, the, 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 the combination of history and fantasy and philosophy uh, to me uh, and, and, and the, the intelligence that shines through his, his writing is just stunning. It's just so beautiful and uh, it, it reaches a reader on so many different levels. And I think that's always been my dream in my writing is to be able to write something that has you know, multiple levels of potential interpretation depending upon mm. the, the reader. I think your poems could reach a very wide audience. Thank really. you. Well, I'd like to add one that. more book. Uh, which, sure. Uh, or one more writer, I should say, several books of hers. Uh, she was an old friend of mine as well, and she died several years ago. Her name was Barty Mukherjee, and she wrote a lot about the immigrant experience. I think she actually won the Book Critics Circle Award or the National Book Award for a collection of stories called The Middleman. And uh, she wrote a marvelous book called uh, Wife, the, not The Wife. My daughter wrote The Wife. This is called yes. just Wife. This is just called Wife. And it's about uh, a woman in Calcutta who is um, very shallow, very submissive, allows an arranged marriage. And then her anger grows. And especially when she and her husband immigrate to the United States, where they're treated very badly. And as Barty was treated in when they emigrated, to, she married a Canadian and they went to live in Canada. <clears throat> and she was uh, really uh, treated very badly with racial bigotry. And mm. you know, her, her writing is so funny and so true. Well, I'm scribbling away while you guys are talking. Um, what up and coming writers are on your radar that you think that some of us ought to know about? Somebody new that, that we might not have heard of or just barely noticed or just if you can think of somebody, I just wanted to mine your brain for that. Well, my at the moment, my, um, you know, a great deal of my focus in the literary world is on um, children's literature and also uh, now in poetry. Um, I don't know if she's so up and coming anymore, but I'm, I've, been, uh, I've been having a good time reading the work of uh, poet Rupi Kaur. Um, I've just discovered um, through uh, a circuitous uh, source, um, a really interesting English poet 
uh, who um, is both uh, Jamaican British and was originally deaf, but is now hearing um, and writes really interesting poet poetry. Um, his name is Raymond Antrobus. Um, again, I, I'm not sure these people would be considered up and coming. I suspect they're probably already arrived, both of them, but they were new to me and uh, and I had a, have had a really good time discovering them. I like to read poetry too. And I think it's wonderful when you're writing fiction to read poetry because it teaches you something about the musicality of language and it teaches you about economy, that less is really more. And when I was teaching, um, I would very often be accused of trying to reduce somebody's four generation saga to haiku because I would want so many cuts. Uh, among the poets I like is um, Robert Hayden, who wrote one of the poems I love best in this world. I believe it's called Those Winter Sundays. It's, it's an absolutely stunning poem. And Philip Larkin, that old misogynist, uh, <laughs> whose work I still love and even have memorized a few of his poems and can recite them by heart, and Elizabeth Bishop. Mm -hmm. But new new people, um, I'm going to think about them the minute we're off. Elizabeth Bishop is one of my favorites, I think. In terms of, you know, real influences, I would say Elizabeth Bishop, Mary Oliver, Billy Collins, oh, Seamus Heaney. Right. Those Lucille, are the... Lucille Clifton is another favorite of mine. Uh, any woman who could write an homage to her hips uh, deserves <laughs> to be read. Speaking of women. <laughs> What are each of you reading right now? Um, I am reading a book called, actually a book that my uh, my sister recommended um, that I have now finally cracked. It's a book called The 10,000 Doors of January by Alex Harrow. Um, and it's quite wonderful. Um, I'm only about a third of the way into it, but I'm having a wonderful time with it. Um, and then I'm, uh, now I'm really looking forward to cracking. I have a book on my nightstand, which I'm really looking forward to cracking. And now I can't remember the name of it, but it's a book about writing, which uses, um, four classic Russian writers as, uh, it's source material. It's sort of a writing workshop as if imagined as if it were taught by, uh, Chekhov and um, Gogol. That's not George, and, George Saunders' book? It is. is it? That's exactly okay. what it is. George Saunders' book. Oh, he's it wonderful. is. Thank you. He's wonderful. What is it called? Please help me I'm out. Looking, it's got a beautiful oh, I'm looking purple cover. at it, but my glasses are terrible. So I just... Uh, it's. I just can't wait to... As soon as I finish 10,000 Doors of January, I, um, A Swim in the Pond in the Rain. Thank you. Well. Thank you. A swim in the pond in the rain, uh, in which four Russians give a master class on reading, writing, and life, or writing, reading, and life. I gather. So well, that's my next. I have been rereading uh, Grace Paley, who's a strong influence for me because she gives you permission to write in a neighborhood voice, uh, which was very important. The way, and also to write about domestic lives, the way Jane Austen does, really, mm -hmm. uh, and show you that it's also about something much larger. When you read Jane Austen and you think a mother is trying to marry off her daughters and it's all so busy and, and female, well, it is really about the lives of women in those times. I think it was Georgian times when women couldn't inherit from their fathers and therefore had to either marry or become a governess or become a prostitute, really. Um, there weren't too many choices for women. Uh, I, I think we've improved somewhat. I would say so. Well, ladies, we're going to sign off because we have filled a very rich and, and wonderful hour with your wonderful thoughts and sharing your material. And the conversation between the two of you was, I felt like I was a guest in the room. It was just, it was delightful. So thank you so much. And thank let me just you, Alice. It's been nice such a treat to be here. And I would love to just also send out a, a special thank you to Roger Rosenblatt for organizing this event. It just, uh, 
very grateful to um, to him for leading the charge in this uh, wonderful program, and to you, Alice, for uh, for taking up the reins and and bringing it forward. Well, you're very sweet to say so. I feel honored to be able to, uh, you know, sort of teeter through these first few episodes. But I just have it's just a thrill for us to be a part of this. Uh, and not just watch it. I mean, it's just, it's always a thrill. So ladies, thank you so much. While I sign off, I'll just say good night to both of you. Thank you. Uh, what we're going to do is we have a recording here that you may come back, same sign in. You're welcome to watch it again as many times as you like and or share it with all your friends. Uh, just to let you know that Next week, we'll have Paul Harding and Subachi Kalagotla, who will be here same time, same station. Uh, if you want a book, you know where the buy button is at the bottom of the page. But from Bird's Books, we'd like to say thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you, Roger, for having Write America here for us. And um, we couldn't have done it without you. Thanks again. Bye-bye.